Good afternoon. I'm Chris Barbie of Grand Valley Alumni Relations. We're excited for today's presentation by Lamar. I'm also excited to introduce our host for today's event, Dr. Damon Arnold, Director of Academic Services in Grand Valley State University's Athletic Department. Thank you very much, Damon, for being our host today. Uh, we always appreciate you taking our phone calls and, and helping us in alumni relations with our programming. And we look forward to you leading to the today's discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and let's have a, a great conversation. Hey, thank you, Chris. As always, Chris Courtney, thank you. Thank you for asking me to do this. I really enjoy it, especially when I have situations and um, opportunities to interview former, former students here at Grand Valley. And so I, I'll continue not to have caller ID. So I don't know it's your call, Chris Cummings. So I'll just answer. All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the third program in Alumni Relations Sustaining, Sustaining Change Series. This session is called Beating the Odds, Overcoming Adversity and Taking Control of Your Story with 2010 alumnus Lamar Brown. Born and raised in Inglewood, one of Chicago's hardest hit, hardest hit communities, Lamar is the first in his family to attend a four-year university and later to earn a Juris Doctorate. Lamar understands what it takes to push through challenges and difficult circumstances to achieve his goals. This will be an intimate conversation. And I'm just, I'm just excited. I'm excited because he's truly what we want our students to, to do, to go over and overcome obstacles and use their tenacity to achieve their dreams. And I'm trying to articulate myself the right way because I'm so proud of this young man because he spent a lot of time and we spent a lot of time having conversations. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. If you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself in the chat, sharing your name, your grad year and degree and why this session was of interest to you. And Lamar, we want you to share some thoughts with us for a few minutes on the topic that we mentioned earlier. And after that, we'll open it up for conversation. So Lamar, the floor, the Zoom is yours. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Arnold. Uh, thank you to Chris. Thank you to Courtney. Uh, thank you to GVSU alumni uh, for creating a space, honestly, uh, for someone like me uh, to be vulnerable and to share uh, my story with um, my peers, uh, my GVSU family, my fellow Lakers. Uh, anyone who uh, may see this uh, now and or later. Um, and I just hope that uh, there may be an opportunity for someone who may be on the brink of something, someone who uh, may be facing their own battles. We all fight our, our own silent battles um, to just keep going, right? Uh, because things do work out for the good of those who love him, right? And uh, I believe that uh, being raised uh, here in Chicago by my grandmother and um, I'm just fortunate to be able to share this. And so um, with that being said, I'll just jump in. Um, so nice to meet you all. Uh, again, as Dr. Dr. Arnold mentioned, uh, my name is Lamar Brown. Uh, I am a um, product of, of Chicago's Inglewood neighborhood. Um, and growing up in the 90s here in Chicago um, was, was quite an experience for me. Uh, I am the middle child of seven, um, old, the oldest boy, um, but I have uh, three older sisters, one younger sister and two younger brothers. Um, my mother, uh, bless her, she was uh, not in my life growing up. Um, I did not grow up with my mother. Um, I did not grow up with my father. And um, I was also born um, with a uh, prenatal cocaine exposure. Um, and that is a proper way of saying that I was um, born a cocaine addicted child growing up. And so um, I faced some difficult developmental challenges um, as a child. Um, and um, I, I think, but for my grandmother stepping in and um, loving me and nurturing me and exposing me uh, to um, the warmth uh, that you get um, when you have family there for you, I don't know where I'd be. And um, 
you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I went to school here in Chicago. And uh, from that, uh, I really stayed involved. I didn't have anyone around, male figures around, uh, to sort of help lead the way. Um, and uh, I, I stayed in the church when I was younger, um, which really helped uh, sort of build some foundation. Uh, I don't know if many of you guys know what being Black and going to church looks like, but uh, I went to a small Pentecostal church here in Chicago, and we were in church for like five hours, <laughs> five or six hours every, uh, every Sunday, uh, and especially on holidays, uh, which was, uh, again, a tes testament to my grandmother's faith and what that meant to our family. And um, once, once I got old enough to really uh, get more engaged, um, I saw sort of my environment and what was around me. Um, and I always think that like, it has to be God's hand on my life, to be honest, um, because there was nothing different in my environment that I saw. Um, there was um, gang activity. I don't know if many of you guys know about the Gangster Disciples or the Black Disciples here in Chicago and um, the notorious uh, housing projects in Cabrini Green and what the drug drug um, uh, trade and, and the drug game looked like here in the 90s, but it had a grip on our communities. And um, the men who I saw in my neighborhood, um, they weren't the men that I wanted to be like. And so I, I found examples in smaller pieces of certain men, be it on television or uh, men in school uh, that I sort of saw, I said, I want this piece, right? And so I would start to emulate, you know, these men that I saw or looked up to. Um, no real context, but it was something that I, that I wanted to do. And so uh, with that, I, I became engaged in the Gear Up program here uh, in Chicago, I actually took a gifted um, exam um, for Diet Academic Center, uh, which was one of the uh, better magnet schools here in Chicago, and I actually got admitted um, with, with great surprise. And um, through that program, I was able to go on college tours and, and um, sort of get exposed to a life outside of Inglewood. Um, for so long, that's all I knew. Never been downtown. University of Chicago is right in my backyard, five, five minutes away and never knew about the university. Um, so which is, um, which was, gives you some context about the kind of barriers that children, black children face here uh, or in environments across the nation uh, that, that lack resources, right? Um, so through high school, uh, got involved, played football. And uh, when it came uh, to the application process for college, um, I actually visited Grand Valley State University. And I was like, oh, this is a great campus. <laughs> As many of you can, can sort of attest to. Uh, but I also was a football player um, and uh, I was interested in playing football for the school. And so um, Grand Valley State was the only school that uh, accepted me. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Um, I applied early admission during the trip there and, and actually got accepted in October of my senior year of high school. Uh, and I didn't have any insight of, into the application process. And so um, that was the only school that I applied to. And I'll often think about what would have happened had Grand Valley State not accepted me and where, where would I be now? And so went to Grand Valley, stayed in Kistler. Shout out to everyone who's ever been or lived in Kistler. Um, and it was a great experience. Uh, I remember getting dropped off and not having any idea of what the next step was. And so I went outside and sat on the stoop and, and just started to introduce myself to uh, folks that walked by. And um, uh, after so long, um, I really became involved in student life. I joined a fraternity there at Grand Valley State, um, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, um, but also became a part of a larger community um, there, there at Grand Valley State. I was involved in student life. I was involved in student senate, uh, obviously with the football team uh, my freshman year, and um, really had uh, the opportunity to really develop uh, my character at Grand Valley State. And um, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Um, 
I majored in public and public and nonprofit administration in undergrad. Um, a kid like me, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what my life would look like. But there's one constant, and the constant is that I always wanted to help people. I wanted to serve my community, um, and I wanted to make life better for others and people that I came in contact with. I've always been told that you should aim to impact every environment that you occupy. And um, that was the reason why I changed my major from like communications <laughs> to uh, nonprofit administration and learned what communities uh, need to thrive, particularly black communities in our urban center. And um, once I finished undergrad, I came back to Chicago and was just like many other graduates, um, unemployed. And so here I am, a first generation college student, and uh, I have this degree in my pocket uh, with no work experience. And so um, I had to humble myself. Humility is a great part of moving forward. Uh, and I took some jobs at some temp agencies. I knew I wanted to go to law school, um, but I didn't know how to get there. And I took some jobs at some temp agencies. Uh, worked in a few legal clerk positions and even so much as worked at the Ferris wheel here in Chicago to get some some extra coins. Um, I took the LSAT four times. And, um, you know, they tell you, oh, well, you know, if you don't get a top score, you're not going to go to law school. Or if your GPA is in a 3.5, you'll never be able to go to law school. And these are these are administrators and guidance counselors and, and practicing attorneys who have t all told me this. And so, but I never gave up. I always um, went back to the well and it really took some additional discipline because I had to give up some really, I guess, fun years um, to ensure that I could solidify a future for myself and um, sacrifice was a great part of that. And um, I know we're running short, but um, I, uh, so once I, once I you know, took the LSAT, I went down to Charlotte School of Law in North Carolina, which again was the only law school that accepted me. Um, I'm a man of faith, and so I decided to go. It was a newly accredited institution, and um, this is 2012. I uh, went down to Charlotte Law, and after my first semester, I was on academic probation. And um, I told myself, okay, I don't want to get kicked out of school because this is the only plan that I have. So um, I'll work harder. And I did. I went up in every, every, uh, every class that next semester. But I also came across an opportunity to go to China for a legal internship. I had been afforded the opportunity through an interview process and um, flew 15 hours, my first time being out of the country to China. And um, 10 days into that internship, uh, I received a notice that I had been dismissed from law school. I'm 24 years old in, in a different country, 15 hours away. And I just got a notice that I had been dismissed from law school. So what, what did that mean? Well, uh, as you know, sometimes you have to take summer classes and, and everything else to get a refund check to get you through the summer, right? Uh, I had nothing all reversed. And so um, I'm on the phone in China uh, when I get the notice and uh, working on a legal memorandum. And I call the airline and say, hey, I've been mugged. I don't have any money. I need to get back to America. And uh, they said the flight is in four hours I left and uh, never looked back. And so I went back home to Charlotte where I was staying at the time. And um, I didn't have any money to make rent for the following month that I had been planning to use the money from the refund check for. And so I sold everything, um, you name it, game systems, beds, uh, TVs, whatever, um, to make the $800 that I needed to, to pay for rent at the time. Uh, the next two weeks I slept on the floor um, until it was time for me to, to, go, to head back to Chicago. Um, and I say this because this was a pivotal moment for me um, because my faith at that point was really being tested. Um, and you hear about these Bible stories and things like that uh, and things and how they get people through. And so I opened up the book of Job 
And, um, you know, in that book, and, you know, he lost everything, but he never wavered. His faith never wavered. And I had meditated on that for those two weeks. Um, and I called my grandmother and she said, I'm still proud of you. Come home. And it meant so much to me to have, you know, have someone who still says that they think that you're doing phenomenal when I felt as if I had failed. Um, and so I packed up my things with the little money I had remaining and, and moved back to Chicago um, and started to apply for jobs. During that time, I also started to volunteer for um, one of the uh, local uh, city councilmen here, Michelle Harris, and um, was about to take a job at Macy's to sell shoes. And um, one of the state representatives, who's a dear brother of mine, he says, do you think somebody like you should be selling shoes at Macy's? And he said, have a little faith. And if you guys see the constant here, faith and sacrifice and discipline um, is a lot of, uh, have a lot to do with where I am right now. And I said, you know what? Okay. I called uh, Macy's, declined the job. A week later, um, I was offered a position with the Chicago City Council. Um, at 25, I was the youngest to be appointed uh, to the Chicago City Council in a government affairs position as a sergeant at arms. Here I am in the middle of the Rahm administration after having um, been dismissed from law school. And so there is always more on the other side of your storm. And um, during that time, I said, I'm also going to go back to law school. I'll be back in law school in two years. And I worked. And I had to take the LSAT again. I took it two more times, never giving up. Uh, I was admitted to John Marshall, uh, to the John Marshall Law School here in Chicago in two years after my return to Chicago. And uh, this time it was much more personal, but also I didn't have any time to waste because I was still working full time for the city council, uh, working on evenings, some days working on weekends, many other days. And um, it meant a lot to me to be able to uh, have this second chance. And uh, in 2017, I took promotion to run a uh, to run government affairs uh, for a city agency, and it was a department of one, and so more responsibility, where I liaised with all the city councilmen and all the state legislatures legis legislators here in Illinois. And in 2019, um, I was able to uh, walk across the stage and earn my juris doctor, and. It's so important to me because just a few months after that, I lost my grandmother. And um, for me, this meant um, a new day for not just for myself, but for my family. Um, many people, uh, including my siblings, um, haven't always gotten it right. And I haven't always gotten it right. But I think what this uh, meant for my family is that there's there's opportunity that there's a chance that despite our circumstances um, we were able to still do something that we all could be proud of and that our children could be proud of and um, today uh, I uh, stand before you as um, not just a licensed attorney um, but um, a better friend a better man um, through the different obstacles and things that I faced in my life. Uh, and I'm pleased to be able to share my story um, because as I mentioned previously, we're all fighting our own silent battles. And um, hearing this and, and um, experiencing someone else's uh, story through empathy or whatever um, can really help you get through that next step and the next phase. And so uh, with that, I wanna thank you for uh, the time that you've been able been able to give me to share uh, briefly, and uh, I'm, I'm here to welcome any questions you may have. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> we're going to open it up for questions uh, momentarily, and if you have questions that you want to put in the chat, feel free to do that. But I have a few questions I want to ask before we get started, but before I say anything, I want to thank you for sharing such a powerful, powerful story. This story that you shared with us is inspiring to everyone not just young, but the old, the power of faith, the power of 
just continuing to press on because when you have a dream in your heart and you have a purpose that you're going after, stay, and it might take a little bit longer than you thought it would take, but stay the course. So thank you for that story. Thank you for staying the course. And thank you more than anything, being vulnerable enough to share that experience because the vulnerability is what helps others to understand that if you can do it, they can do it as well. So thank you for sharing that. So I have a question for you. And the first question I have for you, Lamar, is you talked about your grandmother who was that foundation. Who were some other people who played a key um, role in you continuing to continue to progress? Who were the mentors in your life and what did they offer you? Did they offer you some words of advice, some, some, some different things that maybe you should look at to say, you know what, I can do this. So who was keeping you encouraged? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, Damon. Um, <clears throat> growing up, I didn't really have a ton of mentors. As I mentioned, um, the male figures in my life were not present, uh, particularly like my grandmother's son uh, was my uncle who was involved in the gangs and, and drugs, um, who would have been a great mentor for me, but he was never around, right? And so I think uh, beginning even in high school, um, I would recognize men that I wanted to be like, right? And I'd reach out to them. And believe it or not, people are more willing to help you than you believe. Um, you just have to sort of get out of your own way and, and reach out to them. And so I think at Grand Valley State, um, there was an advisor um, for me, his name was uh, Ray Williams. Um, he was on the, he was a track coach um, who uh, really looked out for me. Um, some older fraternity brothers um, who um, had had been examples. Yourself, I remember coming to speak to you several times, um, not just about school things, but life things. Um, and then I think after college, uh, many of the officials that I would work with, um, many of the um, lawyers that I would work with, um, they were mentors to me. And more than just mentors, they were sounding boards. I think the pressure uh, to, to to get it right because there's no safety net, right? Uh, with For someone like me, there's no safety net. If I fall and tumble, um, I don't have my parents to come bail me out. If I get arrested or get a DUI, I don't have anyone to come and help me, right? And so I think the burden itself is crushing. Uh, the pressure to get it right all the time is crushing. And so, uh, what speaking to these men and, and also women, quite frankly, um, meant, meant to me was it was it was a relief, right? Um, you know, it was a, a reassurance that they were able to offer me. And so um, I think uh, those were the particular mentors and, and, and that's what it meant for me um, to have that experience with them. Definitely. Once again, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Um, I have one more question and then I just want to open it up for the people who may have a question for you as well. Lamar, I, I keep just, just thinking about you just making it through this adversity, right? Those obstacles. And, 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 and I would be remiss if I, if I didn't talk about, I know that's important because that's what happened in my life. Sure. But we have a bunch of people on this particular Zoom who may be struggling with different things. How important is it to ask for help. You know, you, you said you didn't have the people there, but how important was it for you to get outside of your comfort zone and ask for the help that you needed? You know, you said you had to call the airline. You said those different things that you had to do. You said your grandmother still being proud of you. How important is it for us to ask for help? I mean, I think it's, I think it's extremely important. Um, but first you have to uh, practice a little humility. Right, and I think um, that's foundational to moving ahead and 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 being able to even reach out and ask for help. Um, we have this this notion or this belief that everyone's always watching us and judging us, right, to see if we're we're gonna do something right or do something wrong. But you, I say to that that no one really cares, no one really cares. And I think the moment that I lost my ego. Uh, the moment that I practiced some humility and said, there's no way that I can do this by myself. Uh, there's an adage that goes, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, um, uh, if you want to go far, uh, go with 
other other individuals that's not really it trust me but <laughs> it's over there so um but yeah I, I there's a village there's a village that i reached out to and um i think it was critically important um i think some things that i learned about myself some things that i learned about how to navigate and how to network and um a, a introduction right i think all of those things are are very critical uh to moving ahead but there's no way um, you can do that unless you ask unless you ask for help, right? Um, individuals on this call, Chris, um, you, uh, Mr. Arnold, and so many other individuals who are on the call or uh, Laker alumni, um, we've all at some point crossed paths and had discussions about how we can move together, move forward together collectively. And um, I think it's so important to be vulnerable enough to share. Um, your needs, wants, and desires with other people. Um, part of it is not really trusting folks, but I think if you can get over and believe that many people are most most people are well intentioned, um, you can really go far. Another question I have for you is: um, Have you had young people reach out to you to be a mentor now? Because now you're on that other end, right? You're on that other end where 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 now people are looking up to you and looking up to not only your story, but but the different things that you've been able to do. So have you had young people reach out to you to be a mentor? <laughs> it's actually so incredible because, you know, here I am and I just don't, I feel like I still haven't done anything, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm very blessed. I'm aware of what I've had to overcome. I feel like there's so much more ahead of me. And so when someone, because there have been individuals to reach out and say, hey, you know, can we get lunch? Yeah, I'd like to run some ideas past you. Or, wow, you really inspired me. How did you get to where you are? Um, it's it's it really makes me hesitate a little bit because I can't believe it myself sometimes, right? Um, but yeah, there have been people to reach out to me, and um, a few a few years back, um, I was a coach uh, and mentor for um, some black boys here in Chicago. Uh, through a summer basketball camp. And for probably five years, I was a coach in that program and developed relationships with the, the young men who were in the program, but also uh, their parents. And uh, similar to how you operate, uh, it was much more about sports um, for me when I would talk to these young men. I would talk to them about life and about discipline and about self-respect. Um, and, and those were some things that I really felt uh, that those men needed to hear, and as as I you know get 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 um, requests for meetings and things like that today um, by young law students um, or individuals who I may come in contact with, um, it, it's still a very chilling chilling experience for me. Uh, but it's really important that I give back, and I recognize that I didn't get this far on my own. And so um, you always reach back as you climb and um, now and forever always help out as many young men and women as I can. Definitely. So at this point, I wanna open it up. If anyone in the room, and, and what we're gonna do now is we have been recording up to that point, but because we haven't asked you if it's okay to, to record you, we're going to turn the recorded part off and we're gonna ask the room, do you have any questions that you would ask that, that you would like to ask Lamar? 